Okay. It's interesting that uh, usually the science side draws a few more people than the technology side. I think we've gone the opposite direction here. But I think what we're going to talk about is pretty exciting stuff. So we'll get started into this. Um, I'll start it with just a, a few uh, remarks to set things up. And then we'll have a series of presentations to go through. I think we have time for coffee in the middle. I'll point out to people that we need to be out of here by noon. Uh, there's another meeting to be here from noon to one while we do the group photo downstairs and lunch. So we'll try and end it up a little bit before noon, and I'll I'll pull off with a hook who's ever going at that point in time, which I think is you, Ken. So. <laughs> okay. So going back uh, about, uh, I guess, four months ago now, um, we put together the first cross-neurodegenerative disease uh, datathon uh, hosted, well, actually ever, not just with Transmart, but ever. Uh, the key thing for this was uh, we have as a mission for the foundation not just open source, but open data and open science. And last year at our annual meeting, Ken and I got together and talked about the project that Michael J. Fox was doing in putting uh, a number of key neurodegenerative disease data sets into Transmart. And we met with uh, the group from the University of Luxembourg who said they also had some interesting data. And we said, well, let's put all these data together and let's run a datathon. Let's bring people together in the same kind of hackathon format and uh, and talk about what we can do there. And so you can see this is the group that we got together uh, uh, in Boston uh, at the end of June this year. And uh, we were, as always, had a nice group of sponsors that helped us out. Uh, we were hosted at Thomson Reuters, who was also a silver sponsor. Dinner was uh, was supported by IDBS. Anybody here from IDBS? I was like, we're over in Europe. I thought we'd get somebody here. but uh, And then uh, Perk and Elmer was our, our platinum sponsor. So a lot of people ask the question, what is a datathon? Um, a datathon is a special kind of thon. And if you were at the awards uh, presentations last night, I think that in the open source community, the thon is the equivalent of what in biology is the ohm. So uh, a datathon is a, a three-day workshop that we bring uh, scientists together uh, to work on a particular uh, data problem. Uh, it's modeled after a hackathon. But in a hackathon, uh, typically what you have are uh, developers come in uh, and are very self-supporting. It's very unstructured, etc. With a datathon, you actually have to have organized and curated and put the data together in a way that's useful if you're going to have a three-day event that works. And so there was a lot of upfront work, number one, in putting together uh, the Transmart instance with the data, so the curation of the data, organization, etc., uh, and loading, uh, not to mention the configuration of the server. And then the other thing about this is that when it comes to intellectual property rights and data, data is, in fact, a lot more complex uh, than software is. But the idea is to bring the scientists together. And then when I talk about scientists, we're talking about data scientists, statisticians, software developers, and neuroscientists uh, to focus on these key sets of questions. So they form into teams. They frame research questions, create and implement a research design, uh, mobilize some data resources, and then at the end of the three days present their, their findings. So what we're going to do today is I'll give you a quick overview of what we did, and then we're going to invite representatives of each of the teams uh, that were able to make it to give a quick presentation of their results. So one of the key questions people ask, well, why would you want to do a datathon? Well, a datathon is really interesting because you're bringing together teams that wouldn't normally work together. You're bringing together scientists that may not normally work together. So to spend three days with a neuroscientist sitting next to a data scientist and trying to answer questions with a particular data set, you see some really interesting things happen. Um, and so that's one of the things that we will see in terms of the results. Uh, and what I'll, when I go around and talk to people that are either in data science or, or neuroscientists or, or other kinds of disciplines, they don't tend to spend a lot of time working in a cross-disciplinary way. It's usually very short periods of time. So an intense three-day workshop where people are all in the same room, all in the same space, working with the same resource is, is a pretty rare event. Uh, and, and quite quite special from that perspective. So for this datathon, we had a couple of key objectives. And what's interesting is we had sort of a, a software development objective, the developing a high-level portal for the data, and then we had two scientific objectives, biomarkers that would be across al Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and then finding some new research findings. And with five teams, and I think we had six uh, software developers in the teams, uh, et cetera, uh, no one chose to do the portal uh, uh, process, so everything was really focused on science, which was quite interesting to me. 
Uh, I wanted to thank the organizers that put this together. So this was a team effort over the course of about nine months to make this happen. Um, at the Transmart Foundation, uh, Kevin Smith, Terry Weymouth, Rudy Potenzone, and Peter Rice uh, did a yeoman's work in pulling things together. At Michael J. Fox Foundation, uh, Ken Kubota, who's here, and Jamie Eberlein. And then we had uh, a very uh, nice crew of people from the community uh, helping out too, <coughs> including uh, folks from Imperial, University of Michigan, Perkin Elmer, Pfizer, uh, Rancho Biosciences, Thomson Reuters, and more. Uh, so it was a, it was a, uh, a multidisciplinary, multi-unit uh, team. And then uh, we limited our, our, uh, our participants to 25. We wanted to have a manageable number for our first datathon. And uh, these are our participants. And you can see they came from a number of different places, you know, from academia, industry, nonprofits, um, you know, uh, even vendors uh, who, who participated in the process. The data that we worked on was uh, a Transmart version 1.2.4 instance. Um, due to some data use agreement issues, which I will talk about uh, towards the end of this, uh, this was an instance that we had to uh, build and deploy uh, at the Laboratory of Neuroimaging at USC uh, to load and, and support these data. Uh, when you look at the instance, everybody has seen a lot of different screenshots of Transmart these days. I'll just point out where we're here in the, in the, the Explorer. You can see the, the private studies we have, the ADNI, BioFine, LERC2, and Parkinson's uh, PPMI uh, does it data sets, <clears throat> and then a set of, of 10 public studies uh, that were loaded here uh, by University of Luxembourg, uh, curated and loaded into the platform. So we had 14 data sets uh, that were loaded into this uh, for to use as a substrate for the datathon. And just to point out the richness of these data, um, you can see the, the richness of the types of clinical uh, endpoints and, and clinical data that are in these, and the N of patients. You know, diagnostic summaries for 2004 patients. Uh, you can see uh, cognitive study uh, evaluations for 1,200 patients, mental state examinations for 2,800 patients. Uh, so there's lots and lots of patient data in here. One of the challenges when you get into building models, and I think some of our participants will talk about, is that if I'm looking for the, <clears throat> the union of all patients that are measured with a particular set of, of, uh, of, study, of tests, then uh, that number becomes actually much smaller than the reported for each of those different measurements because you're looking for patients that had all of those sets of measurements. Uh, I can think of a study that we've done in the past where we started out with 2,000 patients. And by pulling patients that had all the measurements that we were looking for, we're down to less than 100. Uh, and this is really, again, when you, when you have access to the data, is you begin to realize the limitations of the clinical study design. And the clinical study designs are often not producing the information that one needs to form a decent analysis. And I think that's one of the messages that we have to get back to the clinicians when we do these kinds of experiments. But uh, again, lots of, lots of good data here, lots of rich data uh, overall. Uh, I will point out the complexity of this. If you haven't worked with the PPMI data set, for example, uh, there's lots of different data from assessments, biospecimens, enrollment data, imaging data, medical history data, uh, subject characteristics. And those are represented, if you were to download the data from, from Loney, in 70 different data tables with an overview data table and 20 other documents associated with this. So these data are not particularly useful in the form that you can get them easily publicly, which was the motivation by putting them in, in Transmart. So by putting these into Transmart, we've now unified, curated, and, and harmonized all these data. Uh, the ADNI data are, in fact, even more complex. So we have uh, 130 different data files. Um, we have uh, data columns, uh, around 6,000 data columns. Uh, very complex individual sets of data. If you want to analyze this as a whole, browse the data, work with the data, very complex. Hence the motivation for putting this into Transmart. In addition, uh, we had several other data sets loaded here. The BioFine data set, which is a smaller study um, in Parkinson's funded by Michael J. Fox Foundation with 119 patients. And then one I think is quite interesting is the LERC2 cohort, which is a genetically defined cohort of uh, Parkinson's disease patients. Uh, containing, in this case, 765 uh, idiopathic PD patients and 777 patients that carry the LERC2 mutation. So one can, can look at the genetic basis of disease uh, uh, versus the disease as a whole. This gets back to the whole mechanistic definition of disease challenge. Um, but again, very complex sets of data, uh, not to mention the 10 uh, curated geodata sets that came from University of Luxembourg. 
And what we were looking for in the datathon was to what could we do here? You know, can we can we demonstrate the value of having these data integrated in the Transmart platform? Can we generate interest in these data sets? So interest people in bringing the data back home uh, to work with it, uh, bring some awareness to what open data is and the need for open data, which I think is I'll put a big asterisk is one of the big points here. Uh, develop new collaborations and define new data and experiments and new methods. And what you'll hear through the subsequent uh, discussions, and, and I think we'll hear Ken uh, summarize, is, is I think we were incredibly successful in achieving these key objectives. So successful, in fact, that uh, Imperial College has uh, uh, offered to host uh, another follow-up datathon to this uh, next summer uh, at, uh, at Imperial College to utilize their global data observatory for, uh, for the analysis, so to bring data scientists into this really new uh, state-of-the-art data science environment. Let me give you just a couple of words about open data. Um, when we started working with these data, uh, and if you go to the NIH web website and look at their, their list of open data sets, uh, the ADNI and PPMI data sets are hallmarks of what they call open data uh, for, uh, for research. And when you look for a definition of open data, this is actually off of Wikipedia, um, open data is defined as the idea that certain data should be freely available to anyone to use and to be able to republish as they wish without restrictions, just like we do with, with open source software. And the goal of open data is, you know, is to have open access to these content. And the philosophy is, is really, you know, goes way back to the Meritonian, uh, Meritonian tradition of science, such that in science, if we openly share data and information, we do better science. And so scientists are, are geared to openly share. However, when we look at these open data data sets that are, 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 are put forward as, as modern examples of how open data should be by our government agencies, we read through a data use agreement which governs our access to this, and what do we find? As we find in the ADNI uh, data set, the statement that you must agree that you will not further disclose these data beyond the uses outlined in this agreement, uh, and understand that redistribution of data in any manner is prohibited. How is that open, right? Secondly, the PPMI, which, uh, you know, again, a, an open data set states, I will not further disclose these data beyond the uses outlined. And not only that, I have to go a step further. I will do my best to ensure that investigators who use the data use appropriate administrative, physical, and technical safeguards to prevent use or disclosure of the data. That's open, right? And then the, you go to the, the, the TCGA data, which is outside of this space. But again, you know, we know that it says the requester and approved users re agree to retain control over the data and further agree not to distribute data obtained through this data access request to any entity or individual. So these are the challenges of open data in the translational research space. Is the data that are most interesting and valuable are present in, in very distributed set sources of data, many times tens or hundreds of Excel files, and you're not allowed to reformat that and redistribute it in any fashion. So that was one of the things that we're after. I'll tell you a little bit of, of the result, which I think we can get to at the end, but what we need to do is really focus on how we change that. And one of the things that the foundation is very interested in as a community is making these data more accessible and more useful by challenging uh, these definitions of open data. So we went through the datathon. Uh, one of the things we did was do a post survey and ask people what their experience was in the datathon. 75% um, of our participants said they were very satisfied with the datathon, uh, and the other 25% said they were somewhat satisfied. I think having, having, you know, 100% of people be at least somewhat satisfied was a good thing for our fir very first datathon. Uh, I've never asked that question at a hackathon. Maybe I should, but I think we would beat the hackathon. Um, Another thing, 82% they would attend another Transmart uh, datathon. Uh, there was a slight skewing as that our scientific writer for this was in this and said, no, they wouldn't attend another datathon. Uh, but 82% would attend another. And 92% of respondents said they want to continue their work and access the Transmart instance. And one of the key challenges to this, we went through a lot of work to get these data up and available uh, on the Loney servers and made accessible to the group, following through all the legal requirements. Um, Every participant had to sign four different agreements for access to four different data sets. Um, and then at the end of this, uh, with 92% of respondents wanting to continue to access the instance, uh, Loney shut down all access the day after the datathon, saying that this was not consistent with their open data policies. 
Uh, what I'm happy to say is over the last four months, uh, working with Ken, working with uh, Mark Fraser and Sohini Chowdhury at Michael J. Fox, with Ken Merrick at PPMI, uh, a couple of weeks ago we had a, a long conversation with Art Toga at Loney. And uh, Loney has now agreed in principle, and we're working through the details of this, but has agreed in principle that if we are to distribute these Transmart formatted data from Loney, that that would be consistent with the data use agreements that are in place now. And so what we have is an agreement that uh, Loney, Michael J. Fox, the PPMI data uh, uh, collaboration and Transmart Foundation will work to make these data from this datathon available. Number one is the hosted instance that we have up there as a virtual machine image itself. Secondly is Transmart ready data, so data that you can download and load directly in with, I think, uh, Julie's staples button, uh, just load it. Uh, and three is preloaded virtual machine images. So you can download a Transmart instance preloaded with data and work with it directly. And I think this is a substantial step forward in making these data accessible and useful to people. It's not all the way, uh, but it's a good first step. You know, our goal is to be able to get to the point where these data really fit the open data model, where people should be allowed to freely access, utilize, and republish these data so that we can share them and move them downstream. Uh, one of the other key outcomes we asked people is, you know, we had a group of 25 people from diverse backgrounds, uh, from academia, industry, uh, nonprofits, uh, from a data science background, a neuroscientist background, a bioinformatics background. Uh, we asked them, well, what was your experience like? And one of the things we asked was, how would you like to see things change? And I think what was interesting is to see uh, those results. And maybe I should take this slide over to our development track as well. They said, I wish I saw the features behind Spotfire Metacore. These were mentioned, but I didn't see them really much as a demo or be able, was able to work with them. So we had some challenges with API that limited that. Um, perhaps code examples of the web services access. People wanted to write some things to access web services. Uh, tools like Galaxy, Spotfire, Disease Maps, and a strong API could be useful. So the API, while it's there, needs enhancement. Um, people were looking for improved performance on the API. Um, this was a nice comment. It's usually faster and more efficient if we can use our familiar software to generate subsamples. There should be a way to upload a list of subjects into the subgroup panel generated outside the platform. So selecting cohorts of patients using data that's analyzed outside the platform and then analyze those inside the platform. That's a really interesting feature that I believe is, is part of what we're doing with, uh, with 1.3 and uh, is implemented in the Smart R uh, application as well. Um, people are looking for PCA and multivariate logistic regression. Um, people would like to see a link between SAS and Transmart. And this is one of the keys uh, on the platform was trying to get better performance, optimizing the platform for use when you have uh, a set of 25 users banging on the system on a constant basis, uh, really demonstrates the, the need to do performance tuning uh, for those end users. So those are some nice outcomes. Uh, what we're going to do is talk a little bit about the awards. I want to list the, the awards here. So uh, we had a number of categories for awards. Uh, the awards were determined by a panel of judges uh, after presentations. Uh, there was an innovation award by the, the team Blue Men Group, and uh, Boris Hett is going to give us a little example of, of what's there. Uh, we had the Biomarker Award uh, that was given both to Team Venetus and the Team Biomarksman. Do we have Team Venetus here? Okay, and Team Biomarksman. Oh, here, Alex. Uh, we had the New Research Award. Uh, this group, uh, uh, P. Daddy and the Notorious LARG, which found two biomarkers related to these genes. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's any representatives of this group here today. They couldn't make it to the meeting. And then a Best Presentation Award for Team Biobricks. Anyone from Team Biobricks here for presentation? There we go, Ken. So, oops, did I do something wrong? Yep, no, I didn't. So that's, uh, <coughs> I'm going to give Martin's talk now, but uh, that's that's the, the presage. What I'd like to do is, is go through and then have the teams give a, a quick update on what they've done, <coughs> and then uh, uh, Ken will give us some summary remarks. So if I can get my glasses, I can see who's first on the list. You are? Alex is first. So uh, let me take a look here. So we'll have uh, a couple of key presentations. We're scheduled for a coffee break at 10.35, no, 10.45. So why don't we do two presentations, and then we'll do coffee break, and then we'll pick up with the rest right after that. Alex? 